you have to have visionaries. You know, you have to have people that will think outside of the norm. We have to be given the power to tell our own stories. We all want to say our piece. This is a crazy time. What they care about is what it means to them. You have to not think like society thinks. This is a fight about power. Who has it and who has the right to use it? We're having a reckoning about what public safety can, should, and must look like. It's about a broader question of representation, who gets to create the images and define how we see the world. They want their voice to be heard. They have to get involved. Finally, we get to tell our truth and tell our stories like our stories matter. What's going to bring people together is equality. The love that we have for each other is the shortcut to true human happiness. You start to see how it's all connected. Every single person around the world can create a movement. Please welcome Senior Vice President and General Manager of Atlantic Live, Candace Montgomery. Good morning, everyone. So glad to see all of you. As Jocelyn mentioned, I am Candace Montgomery, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Atlantic Live, and thank you all for joining us today. Education lays the foundation for our culture, democracy, and economy. The past two and a half years have revealed and exacerbated the significant issues and challenges facing our students, teachers, and society. Many students struggle with mental health, teachers feel burned out, and the opportunity gap has widened, along with college enrollment declining. But these challenges have also spurred a renewed focus on finding sustainable solutions and reimagining a more equitable education system designed for the future. This morning, through a series of conversations, we discuss the most pressing challenges, workable solutions, and how we can rebuild an education system that centers on equity and innovation. Before we get started, I want to thank our underwriters, Equitable and Walton Family Foundation, for supporting the Atlantic journalism today. I would like to also remind all of you tuning in at home that you can participate in some of the questions via the Q&A tab on your screens. Please tell us where you are from, and if you have a question, please submit it for our speakers. We will do our best to incorporate it into the conversation. Now, let's get started. For our opening conversation on the future of America's education system, please welcome the U.S. Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, with Atlantic staff writer, Adam Harris. Secretary, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Thank you, glad um, to be here. Yeah, let's, uh, let's jump right in. So on Monday, the latest Nations Report card uh, data was released making clear the devastating effect of the pandemic has had on America's students. Um, the results show a decline in reading and the biggest drop in math performance in fourth and eighth grade since the program began. Um, so what was your initial reaction to, to the report? So I've been in education for uh, couple decades, <clears throat> the data clearly showed uh, the impact of the pandemic. And uh, the, the drop uh, was significant. What I noticed was while there was a drop in reading and a drop in math, there was an increase in urgency around the data. And I, and I say that because in 2019, the data weren't too good either. Three years before that, it wasn't too good either. <laughs> so what, what I recognize is that our students are underperforming, and there's a sense of urgency around it today that, as an educator, my whole career, I haven't felt in a while. So, so not only is there a greater sense of urgency, there are more funds in education than ever before. Mm. We all know there's a bigger spotlight on education than ever before. So my mentality is let's embrace it and let's do what we know we need to do to help address decades of inequities that have been normalized in our country. And let's, let's, take, let's take the lead here. Let, let's, let's move and give students an opportunity uh, 
to achieve at higher levels. Let's reverse this trend with, with a passion that we haven't had in the past. Yeah, and actually, you, so you mentioned the drop in 2009, the drop this year, or 2019, the drop this year, um, or, or not necessarily a drop, but the number's not looking as good right, in 2019. Right. How do you start to reverse that trend and make sure that the sort of academic recovery is, is equitable for, for students? You know, I was, <clears throat> so the, the data came out Monday. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, Wednesday, we already had a summit at the Department of Education. <laughs> We're not wasting time here. And I, I challenge leaders across the country not to get enamored with things, with individual strategies. We have to have a shift in mindset, a transformational shift is going to get us to where we need to go, which means that while the American Rescue Plan dollars serve as a tremendous down payment for transformational change, we need to believe that we're going to invest in education differently for a very long time. And I don't mean just financially. I mean you know, putting emphasis on how our students are performing, hmm. ensuring that we have the best, uh, most uh, highly trained workforce. Um, because it's, it's easy to say, I'm going to take money and I'm going to focus on tutoring. Feel good. Hmm. But the harder work is ensuring that from 9 to 3, we have highly qualified teachers that are getting compensated to the point where they don't have to work on the weekends or they don't have to question every year whether or not they want to come back. No amount of tutoring is going to make up for that core. Yeah. So for me, it's an opportunity for us to think transformationally, to really take a step back. And I, and I tell leaders across the country at this, at this uh, summit we had yesterday where we had leaders from you know, superintendents, state chiefs, talking about what they've done and what they plan on doing. Um, we have to embrace this disruption in education and not build it back the way it was before. Because in 2019, without a lot of fanfare, our black and brown kids were underperforming by 10, 15 points on average, hmm. and nobody was, nobody was talking about it. So this is an opportunity we can't let go to waste. What were some of the sort of interesting strategies that, that those superintendents and folks um, uh, that kind of stood out? <clears throat> you know, so we had a, a variety of uh, strategies we have a lot of mental health support. We know it's harder to learn if you're not well. You know, we all know, like kind of going back to Maslow's Pyramid, right? <laughs> if you're hungry, uh, if you don't have housing, if uh, you're, you know, you have food insecurities or housing insecurities, or you, you, if you have a toothache, it's harder to learn. But we we moved that forward and we said, you know, if you're not well, if you dealt with trauma and it's, and you're not addressing the trauma, it's going to be harder to learn. So those learning conditions, um, wraparound services for kids, connecting with local community partners. Because as much as we want to have more social workers supporting our students, and that's an effort that we need to do, we also know that it takes a village, right? Mm -hmm. So connecting with uh, com uh, you know, community-based uh, partners to ensure students have after-school activities. But going into the classroom, what we saw was um, you know, focusing on the core instruction. You know, as I said before, high-quality teaching, good uh, curriculum, student engagement. We saw pervasive after-school programming that focused on ac academic recovery, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's something that it was uh, pervasive in a lot of these plans. Um, and not just random, you know, after-school tutoring. It's focused on what content was missed, connected to core instruction. Um, we saw better uh, engagement with families, uh, you know. And in some of my visits, and it was mentioned yesterday, I saw school systems thinking differently about how we engage families. So some school systems in, engage in utilizing uh, the American Rescue Plan dollars to, to hire community school liaisons or parent liaisons to try to help connect some of those students that during the pandemic we, we lost them. Hmm. You know what I mean? So they're really thinking outside the box. Another thing that I'm really proud of and I want to see, continue to push is the understanding from our district leaders and our state leaders that much like reopening schools, we couldn't do it alone. Addressing the needs of our students moving forward, we can't do it alone. Mm. Removing silos, working with community-based partners, health departments, uh, different agencies to make sure that um, all hands are on deck moving in the same direction for, for our kids. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just thinking, kind of still thinking about the, the you know, nation's report card results. Um, you know, when, when a kid comes home with a report card, sometimes they may have had a bad grade. It's like, but mom, look, I have, yeah, I yeah, have yeah. this other, I have a good grade on here as well. Like, so what, were there any bright spots um, or, or signs for hope 
um, in, in the latest Nations Report card results? Look, I, I feel very confident that we can reverse what we saw. Hmm. I, I really do. And, and I do believe that if we were thinking, you know, going back to 2019 data, we'd be cutting, you know, cutting our kids short. Mm -hmm. We need to do better than that. I wouldn't say bright spots, but what I did see is that our urban centers held their own more. I think there was, it was flat, meaning they didn't drop in, I think, 65% of our urban centers. Um, so the efforts when students did go back uh, or the efforts to connect them during the pandemic when they weren't in school um, prevented loss in some of those areas. But look, we need to be moving forward on where we are. Uh, again, even if we were talking about 2019 data, that's unacceptable. We cannot normalize that in this country, under 50% of our students are achieving and reading. That's not, we, we have to do better than that. And I feel confident that we will. Yeah. You mentioned teachers earlier. Um, our nation's teachers are, of course, also struggling at the moment as evidenced by you know, teacher shortages and the growing feeling of sort of burnout um, and demoralization among some teachers. So what are the biggest challenges that teachers are facing now and how um, can the nation address uh, some of those issues and invest in um, better support for educators? I started off as a fourth grade teacher uh, and I remember going into the profession kind of feeling like a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, like I have to prove that teaching is a profession, right? And um, regardless uh, what position I've had, I was a school principal, district leader, uh, state leader, um, it always felt like we're still fighting to make sure that the profession is respected as such. Hmm. That's where we are today, man. This teacher shortage is a symptom of a teacher respect issue. There are states in our country where teachers make 30% less than other college graduates. We have normalized as a country that teachers are bartending on the weekends, that they're driving Uber on the weekends. They're responsible for helping our children reach their potential. We've normalized treating the profession less than what it should be. And we see the results of it when when they have options, they say, I'm not doing this. Um, we have to do better. So it's not just pay. It's respect, but respect also means you're paying them competitively. Um, it also means working conditions, right? You want to know when you go into the profession that there's opportunities for growth. Um, and historically, our, our pathways haven't been clear for teachers. There are a lot of teachers who have a lot of skill sets that are not being tapped. So you know, providing professional learning opportunities for them, giving them pathways to be teacher leaders. Uh, you know, in most places, we have like two or three professional development days for teachers. And if they're lucky, they get an hour a week with colleagues to talk about student data. And usually that's very prescribed, what they have to do there. So, you know, I've been talking recently about ABCs of teaching. If we're going to move forward, A is agency. Let's treat them like professionals. Let's listen to their voice. Let's give them some autonomy. They're trained. Many of them have master's degree plus. Mm -hmm. Agency. B, better working conditions. And I'm not just talking about MERV filters. I'm sure all of you are experts in MERV filters <laughs> and air quality. But, but just pathways, you know, giving them opportunities for uh, career advancement uh, and development. And then C, competitive salary. You can't get around that. You can't get around that. A lot of these folks are struggling uh, to send their children to college or to, to buy a home for the first time. You know, you shouldn't be a teacher in this country and qualify for state assistance, period. This may be more philosophical, but you, you mentioned sort of we, we've normalized. We've normalized. Um, why do you think that is? We've normalized what, the respect? Or the yeah, the, the respect, yeah, the respect. You know, I, I, and I tell teachers this, I tell uh, leaders this, I tell principals this, we are a student-centered profession. We care about children at the expense of ourselves. These same teachers that are making a poor salary in many, uh, in many states are not hesitating to put their hand in their own pocket to buy things for kids. They're here for kids at the expense sometimes of themselves or their profession. So if they're not bringing it up, fighting for it, what ends up happening is there are other priorities that 
uh, get the attention. And I've said before, you know, and this is on my, my personal thinking, you know, we have about 75% of our teaching workforce are women. Would it be the same if 75% were men? Hmm. You said we're going to get philosophical, so we're going to get philosophical. <laughs> no, no, I, I appreciate that. I, so I, thinking about the American Rescue Plan funding that is, that is still available, how can that be utilized to sort of strengthen teacher and, and student well-being um, and, and also sort of account for um, some of the helping students catch up um, yeah. to where previous students had been. You know, yesterday I said uh, in my remarks, it's a, the American Rescue Plan is one hell of a down payment for transformational change in education. $130 billion in K-12, like, that's unheard of. Unheard of. Um, what we need to do is ensure that we're not dressing up the same system that didn't work for so many of our students. Hmm. So uh, when I talked to leaders yesterday, I said we need to really create transformational change. Um, disrupt systems. Why are our high schools designed the way they were 50 years ago, where we're not meeting the workforce, where we have still the, what we call the murky middle, students that are not sure what they want to do when they graduate. We should be connecting two-year colleges to our high schools. We should be doing a better job removing silos in education so that the two-year, four-year workforce partners, we're all talking so that when their kids get to high school, they have options when they graduate. Mm -hmm. We have to do that. We have to be uh, so focused on early childhood education because we know brain science tells us that's when they learn and that's where gaps are created. How are we doubling down on that? So what I don't want are shiny things for the next two, three years, and then, well, the American Rescue Plan money's done. Let's go back to the system that got us to where we were, where we've normalized poor scores. So my push is really like lift the profession, evolve our high schools, provide better access to higher education, and fix the core system, hmm. the instructional core. It goes back to the core. Absolutely. Um, and, and speaking of sort of linking those two, that's yeah. a good segue to higher education. I want to shift the focus um, for a moment. Uh, so last Friday, an appeals court um, temporarily halted President Biden's executive order on debt relief. Um, what is the administration's response to the development, and what is your message to borrowers seeking that relief? My message to borrowers is keep applying. We have public service loan forgiveness waiver that ends Monday. Uh, you know, I've talked to folks who've gotten over $80,000 in debt forgiven who are just a, a new lease on life. Hmm. Um, and then we have the, the broad-based uh, targeted loan relief program that was announced in August. Uh, a week and a half. A week and a half. We have information on over 22 million uh, borrowers. Hmm. That shows you the interest that there is in this. Um, I'm telling those folks continue to apply, about 40, uh, 40 million are eligible for that. We're gonna, take, we're gonna keep fighting in the courts. We're gonna do what we have to do. We're prepared uh, for, for some of these um, lawsuits and we're, we're not gonna stop fighting. And you know, it's, it's important to just think about the context here. We have folks suing us because we wanna provide $10,000 or $20,000 in debt relief to people making $75,000 or less, right? 90% uh, of the money is going to that. You would qualify if you make less than $125,000, but about 90% of the dollars are going to people making $75,000 or less. Yet, some of the folks pushing lawsuits on us are people that benefited from loan relief last year through PPP in excess of $100,000. There was one person, uh, the president does it best, he just names them. <laughs> Over a million dollars in debt relief last year. They're suing us because we want to help people who are struggling to get back on their feet after this pandemic. Hmm. Like, we normal, come on. We should be outraged by that. We're fighting. The process is simple. I bet you if you start right now, before the timer goes off, you'll be done with the application process. We want to make it simple. We know, as I said, 90% of the dollars are going to people making under 75000 We know in terms of addressing disparities. We know over 60% of our Latinos are eligible for Pell. Over 70% of our black borrowers are eligible for Pell. And we know that when it's all said and done, 
42% of our black borrowers are going to have a zero balance in student loans. Almost half of our Latino borrowers, zero. We're doing, you know, it's, it's really about letting them know that we're looking out for them, but also recognizing that the system is broken, right? So there are many other things that we're doing. Loan forgiveness gets a lot of attention, but I, I encourage everyone to peer deeper what we're doing. Mm. Uh, loan forgiveness is great. I'm probably more proud of the income-driven repayment changes that we're making. Um, we're going to increase college accountability. Like lower, make a good return on investment and make sure that you're doing right by kids. And we're going to go after colleges that are not or programs that are not. That's important, too, to know. So si higher education could be more accessible. Well, actually, can you talk a little bit more about the income-driven repayment changes yeah. Yeah. Um, as well as some of the accountability measures you all have taken? So one of the things I heard traveling uh, across the country was people were saying, look, I'm paying six, $700 a month in my student loan. That's, I can't, can't afford that. Uh, so the income-driven repayment process uh, changes what, you're, what you have to pay from 10% of your income to, to 5%. So right there, cutting it in half. And it uh, shortens the time that you're paying loans to 20 years. Hmm. So after 20 years, you shouldn't be continuing to pay for education that you got 20 years ago. Um, we're making it more, access, you know, more affordable there. Uh, that's going to help people for generations to come. So people who are not benefiting from this loan uh, forgiveness now are still going to benefit from income-driven repayment. I talked to you about public service loan forgiveness. 98% hmm. of the people were turned away uh, two years ago. Now we provided over $14 billion in debt uh, forgiveness to people who earned it. It was a bipartisan bill passed in 20, uh, 2007. We got it working. Um, the college scorecard. We're communicating with parents and students how your college ranks in terms of upward mobility, graduation rates, the things that matter to parents, right? Um, and we're working with college presidents because they have to be a part of the solution too. Right? So we're listening to them to see what support they need. And we're also looking at what states are paying, because part of the tuition hikes are some states have gone down in their mm -hmm. contribution to higher ed. So what does that mean? It translates to higher tuition. You know, I'm, we're going to be putting out some data soon that shows a state-by-state -state analysis of how much they're contributing to the higher education system over the last 10 years. Some states have gone down like 20 points. Hmm. So nobody's talking about that, but that translates into higher tuition. Um, and so uh, you mentioned public service loan, loan forgiveness. Um, as this was a very, a very recent improvement. Uh, so yeah. on Tuesday, uh, you all announced uh, some new actions. Good, somebody saw yeah, it. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I, I keep, I keep. I was telling him that, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're so proud of the work that we're doing. That sometimes, you know, an announcement on Tuesday is going to get overshadowed by an announcement on Thursday. Um, but that's a that's a huge win for for borrowers. Can you can you walk us through the, sure. the PL, PSLF changes? Well, the public service loan forgiveness program, as I told you before, was broken. Uh, we worked really hard early on. The president made it very clear, let's fix this. People who are public servants should have loans forgiven the way it was intended to be when it was, the law was written in 2007. So we, we fixed it. But part of fixing it meant we had to take a waiver for one year and bring in some of those folks that were misled, uh, that were told wrong information or were, weren't told which loans they have to take to qualify for this. It, it was a mess. It was a mess. We cleaned that up by saying we're going to do a waiver and we're going to bring all of them under our umbrella, right? And um, so we had a year to do that. The, it ends Monday, right? Mm. But we recognize that um, some of the benefits under this waiver will help borrowers moving forward. So we're extending a lot of these benefits uh, permanently. And that's what we announced this week, that while the waiver is going to end uh, Monday, in July of next year, through our um, through our process of uh, you know uh, rulemaking, um, we have benefits that uh, were eligible under the waiver, but are now going to be permanent. And we want folks to take advantage of that. We need folks to go into public uh, service, and we want to make sure that the intent of this law is carried out in our implementation. Yeah. On the state decline in uh, sort of funding for higher education since, you know, about 2008, right, since the recession, you've seen a, this mm -hmm. sort of sharp declines. You know, in the last year or so, uh, I guess two years, thanks in part to the stimulus packages, um, there was a, a, it was a sort of renormalization of yeah. those, those previous levels. How do 
how does you know how do policymakers ensure yeah. that those kind of increased levels of funds that, that sort of temporary injection doesn't you know isn't just a temporary injection? How do you start to, to yeah. fund higher education yeah. in, a, in a more robust way? You know, I tell people don't forget Omicron. Remember Omicron? Remember when that came, that three-week period where schools were closing, not because people had COVID, but because people were quarantined? That's what happens when you don't have enough staff. When the schools shut down, communities shut down. So what I'm trying to tell folks is we are at the doorstep of another crisis, K-12, if we don't get this teacher shortage issue addressed the right way. And ARP is not the Band-Aid for all things education. It's going to get us back in school. Uh, really kickstart acceleration uh, uh, recovery of academic needs, mental health needs, mm -hmm. and making sure our buildings are safe. There were some buildings whose uh, air handling system wasn't touched in 20 years, deferred maintenance. I, I visited some schools that it, it was just unsafe. The, the, the systems were not being taken care of. So that's what the American Rescue Plan dollars are for, to provide recovery. But it's not to address decades of neglect in education um, in one shot. So again, I said yesterday, look, our leadership challenge now is not only to address a recovery, but to create a culture of understanding that unless we invest in education differently, our students have, are going to still be at that level of 2019 achievement. We have to invest in our schools, and it has to be a long-term um, investment. And then the result, if we don't do it, are going to look like what would have happened if we didn't have the American Rescue Plan? We'd be talking about which colleges are closing. Hmm. We'd be talking about which schools don't have enough staff members and having teachers who are not certified because we're trying to just find substitutes teaching our kids what chance do we have of this country getting back to the number one spot if we're not investing in education, which gives our students an opportunity to thrive? Hmm. Yeah, I just think we just have to paint that picture. And for me, Omicron was a good reminder of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my, my last question, sorry, this, this is a, a, it's not a small question for, for a final question, but you mentioned school safety, um, and that's always, of course, been one of the, the, the top level, um, uh, top of mind topics for yeah. the last couple of years. Um, so what are you all doing on, on that front in order <clears throat> to make schools safer, um, not only in terms of, you know, respiratory safeness, but, but physical safety as well? Yeah, See, that's a big deal. Anyone who's a parent in the room knows you know, that's the most important thing that we think about, right? When I drop off my children in school, I want to make sure that they're safe. Um, I can tell you, I was a school principal about 45 minutes away from Sandy Hook when that happened. So in real time, I was watching it unfold. Um, that changed how I led from that day forward. Protocols were put in place, different measures, different communication systems different protocols for an un unwanted person in the building or suspicious activity or so, whatever. It changed how we, did, how we did things. And I was fortunate that I had a district in a state that understood the importance of that. Unfortunately, across the country, that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. We're, the Department of Education has uh, different offices that focus on helping districts and states build emergency plans that are uh, take strategies that we've learned from different places that we know work. But it's really important to share the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Uh, and I'm really proud that the president, um, I know Senator Murphy from Connecticut and so many others, really said, look, we got to do something. Mm -hmm. So there's a billion dollars that we pushed out already to make sure that plans are uh, adequate, that safety plans are adequate. A billion dollars went out already. We pushed it out right away. There's another billion dollars coming to make sure that mental health supports are available so that when we see flags, we address it. Right now, the ratio of students to counselors, in some places, it's over 500 to 1. Hmm. That's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. So the funding can help with that. American Rescue Plan dollars can help for that. But I think we just have to continue keeping a sense of uh, elevated focus on ensuring that our schoolhouses are safe, but that we're also communicating as educators the importance of a safe community. I always say no door lock in an elementary school is going to compete with an AR-15. I don't care how good the locks are. Hmm. So let's, be, let's, be, let's have some common sense here. Common sense, uh, gun legislation, uh, making sure that our communities are safe are critical because it's happening in mosques, it's happening in churches, it's happening in supermarkets as well.
Well, Secretary, we'll have to leave it there for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Now for our discussion on arts and sciences, the future of STEAM education, please welcome Chris Brown, Deputy Associate Administrator of NASA's Office of STEM Engagement, Jeanette McCune, Director of School and Community Programs at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, with Susan Salney, Contributor at Atlantic Live. Thank you so much for being here to talk about the importance of arts in science education. We're talking about STEAM today. And after so many years of hearing the acronym STEM, forward-thinking educators like yourselves have decided to add an A for arts um, to suggest a new framework, really a national initiative to better prepare our students for the future of work. So let me start by asking you why bringing art and science education together is so important in inspiring ingenuity and innovation. Thanks, Susan. I'll, I'll take the first stab at that. Good morning, everyone. It's really great to be with you all. Um, I think when I was thinking about, by the way, I wasn't, I'm not Mike Kincaid, in case you were looking at your programs. Um, I'm subbed in for him today at the last minute. As I was thinking about um, being here today, the first thing that came to mind was really my own personal journey in that um, really the, that my pathway into STEM began with a love for building and art and drawing. And then that led to exploratory work. I grew up in a really tiny town in Pennsylvania where, and I was the first uh, person in my family to go to college. And there were those little opportunity where I grew up. And so um, I had an affinity for math and science that I developed in my schoolwork, in my academics. And that intersection between that uh, love for building and drawing and, and uh, design combined with uh, math and science really led me to actually start a major in architecture that I ended up translating into a, a later a career in engineering. And so, um, so I think it's really important as I tell students, um, engineers and scientists kind of still stereotypically and societally get a little bit of a bad rap. I think it's better now than it used to be, but uh, certainly it, there's still that stereotype of, of the geek with a negative connotation. And engineers, being an engineer, um, engineers are creative souls. We are innovative, um, we, are, we are designers, builders, innovators, we test the things we do, we do lots of hands-on work. And in addition to that, it's not, it's, it's not a solitary endeavor. Uh, it's a team sport. We do everything in collaboration. And that notion of transdisciplinary efforts and, and for students, experiences that are transdisciplinary are so important. And by the way, the work that we do at NASA, all the challenges that we undertake, it takes all walks of life to bring that, to bring that into being. And so um, with us, we also combine work that, are, that is done by communicators and graphics artists and designers um, in things that are not in the technical realm. And it's so important to have those collaborative and creative and communication skills to be able to do the work we do to bring an idea into reality and, and amazing discoveries. Excellent. Jeanette, why do you think STEAM is a better way to go forward than STEM? 
Well, uh, and thank you also for the opportunity to be here today. Um, at the Kennedy Center, we are, have definitely believed in the creative process, which aligns with STEM. And we found that there was so much overlap between the artistic process as well as the science, technology, engineering, and mathematical process. And some of the key languages, creativity, inquiry, design thinking, critical thinking, and collaboration, all that my colleague just spoke of. But that's absolutely critical in this work. And that furthermore, um, it's, it's not isolated. The arts are not an isolated experience. They require that revision, that analysis, the synthesis, all of the same common language and the common approach that is engaged in, this, in the STEM work. So that for us is, is a big part of it. And just sharing a personal story, um, my background is as a musician, and I loved math growing up. Um, and the analytical aspects of classical piano, thinking about how the pieces come together. But I wanted to combine those two things even as a career. And so being in the arts management, it absolutely created and, co and connected for me. So that was also critical to us. Oh, thank you for that perspective. Sure. Uh, brain research actually backs up the idea that there are ideal conditions, let's say, uh, for learning. And arts integration actually provides that. And Chris, NASA is a huge proponent of this, as you mentioned. Can you tell us about the Office of STEM Engagement, um, its work to foster arts and creativity in science? You've been at NASA for 25 years, and I understand you helped write the blueprint on this. <laughs> yes, and, and yes, Susan, I did. Um, so a few years ago, we looked at uh, our work in education and public outreach at NASA. Um, it, education and public outreach is an in inherent and very important part of our mission. It actually was written into the Space Act in the founding of NASA in 1958. And the work that we do, especially uh, those of us in the technical um, fields, we, we feel it is so important for us to nurture and guide that next generation of explorers. And, um, and we do that with lots of passion at NASA. Um, our office, the Office of STEM Engagement, is responsible for all of the educational efforts that are, that are underway. Um, we have a $137 million investment in that um, this past year, and that includes uh, work in creating learning opportunities for students. Um, those are, include immersive learning opportunities like challenges and competitions, as well as internships and fellowships. We also support educators. We, we build educational resources and provide resources and learning opportunities for educators to use in their classrooms. And in addition to that, we provide direct support to educational institutions around the country, including minority serving institutions. Over the past couple of years, I've led an effort to um, identify focus areas that we wanted to move forward in that I think are really relevant. The first is in broadening student participation. I think you heard from Secretary Cardona about uh, several aspects of that, in that uh, we as a, a nation are, are, are behind in, in education, of course, as you all know, in math and science. And we're also um, in, in the midst of numbers that, uh, for me, as an engineer, I started out where women in engineering were around 8% of the workforce it's really not much better. I think it's right now at about 16%. And of course, for people of color, it's, it's, it, we're, we're, not, um, in, we're not bringing uh, people into STEM as we should and having an adequate uh, diversity uh, in the workforce for STEM. So at NASA, we are focusing on broadening student participation, and we're also bolstering our efforts in K-12 because we recognize that we have to build a foundation, all of us, with an adequate number of students entering into STEM um, early in, in the course of their studies, in the order of uh, middle of, of elementary school into about fifth or sixth grade. And so we're focusing on that as well. Great. And Jeanette, the Kennedy Center is also on the cutting edge of this. Can you tell us about the center's changing education through the arts program and the different ways that uh, schools have integrated arts into their curriculums with your help? And I, should, I also want to thank um, Secretary Cardona and the U.S. Department of Education as they have been such critical partners in supporting our work um, to assure that uh, arts education is a civil right for every child. And so our work in professional learning, which is what the Changing Education Through the Arts program is about, 
is around empowering and supporting teachers and in innovating and integrating the arts across the curriculum. Um, so our professional development actually started in 1976. It's one of the three pillars of the Kennedy Center, world-class arts, um, a, 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 a living memorial to John F. Kennedy, and powerful education. And um, around the end of the 90s, as we were looking at what are the integration points between the arts and other subject areas, uh, arts integration really took off. And Kennedy Center created an, a, an, in collaboration with educators across the country and other leaders, we actually came up with a definition to help guide that work, which I want to share with you, um, that arts integration is an approach to teaching in which students construct and demonstrate understanding through an art form. Students engage in a creative process which connects the art form and another subject area and meets evolving objectives in both. So it's, it means it's ongoing learning, it's ongoing connections between those areas, and for us the professional development looks at what hands-on learning for students and understanding that teachers are not just technicians, but they are actually someone who assesses, understands what a student needs, and looks at authentic connections between the art form and other content area in order to enliven the experience. It's really focused on our students being able to be engaged in active learning and being able to express through a variety of modalities the learning that they, that they have had. So for us, that's what the arts integration work is really about, is making those connections. And we look for those authentic connections between the art form and another area. So as you were sharing around science, scientific processes or mathematics, we look for patterns. We look for other, um, other, tech, other uh, vocabulary and other experiences that connect between those areas. So again, ultimately looking for where are those authentic connections? How can dem students demonstrate that understanding through both the art form and the other content area? And continuing to listen to our educators in terms of the innovations and ideas that they have. A big part of our work is also reducing the isolationism of our educators, professional learning through um, professional learning communities, being able to identify and create lesson plans that can be shared with others across the country. We want to recognize and um, honor the work of our teachers, but making the, uh, the work that is artistic um, and fun. I don't think fun is a bad word for education, but allowing for our young people and our teachers to have fun and to play and to express that understanding. So our professional learning program really focuses on that. Um, we have seven model schools that are in this community in Washington, D.C., and we have an, an arts integration conference that we hold each summer, um, allowing our educators to come from around the country to share ideas with their colleagues and then go back and put into practice that work. And then we are uh, very fortunate that we have a research and evaluation department at the Kennedy Center that also helps us to actively look at what is the learning, what is the efficacy, how are we seeing our students better able to express their understanding through the art forms that they might not be able to do in isolation. So we're very proud of and continue to um, learn from our network as well as to share for, with our network. Let's talk a little bit more about that idea of isolation and the silos that different disciplines are in. We're talking about STEAM as though it's a new concept, but actually it's a throwback, right, to the way things were even hundreds of years ago. I mean, if you think of someone like Leonardo da Vinci, um, to him, art and science were really inseparable. And there's a quote, and I love this quote. He said, art is the queen of all the sciences. <laughs> Who do you think he meant by that? Oh, my goodness. The queen of... I think it's the connector. I think it's what brings us all together. And a recognition that, again, I think the way that school is set up now and, and has been for quite a few years is we go to each of our disciplines. And even the way that school is, has typically been set up, there's very little time for teachers to talk collaboratively about what they are teaching to each other. They will see students throughout the day, but there is some, there is some disconnection in the structure of the way that school is set up. And as a result, oftentimes we're not necessarily clear. It's no fault of our teachers. It's more of a scheduling challenge and focusing on the specific discipline. But students are not isolated. And so being able to create opportunities for time to collaborate, to discuss that work, and then be able to um, look at the common ground of what students need to learn, um, and teachers being able to have that time to work collaboratively together. But the queen means it really holds it together. I believe it also ultimately also focuses on art as a process that celebrates the individual as well as connecting us to others. So that's kind of my interpretation of that. Great. Uh, Chris, there's a lot of focus at NASA on having what you call authentic learning experiences um, tied to real world endeavors and major milestones. Can you tell us about some of those? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. I think it was, as, as Jeanette talked about, there's, there, we are, I, I said earlier that we are focusing on enhancing our work in K-12. 
And part of that, as well as trying to achieve a more broadened student participation in NASA programs, is, is to look to build authentic experiences that, first of all, attract students in. And part of that for us is, again, thinking about that transdisciplinary aspect, is how could we attract students who might not necessarily be already kind of part of the scene. Um, and so uh, an example I want to share is two years ago, we issued a MOOC essay designed um, K through 12 students and asking them to immerse themselves in, in a sense of a design process of what would they build to live on in the moon and how would that work and what would they take with them. And so what was great about that essay contest was that we reached students all over the country who might not normally engage with us. So it's, it's kind of changing the, uh, changing the entry. What is the barrier? what are the barriers to entry and what we want to do there that could um, be meaningful. In addition to that, we do immerse students in that fun factor. How can we bring a, a team of students together in and those challenges, how we could um, bring them into learning the art of the process of designing and building an instrument or a particular experiment that, that could eventually uh, conceptually fly on, on a rocket. Um, we just did Tech Rise, which was just, I think, just closed just a few weeks ago, inviting K-12 student teams to literally build um, an instrument that will, they will compete, and one, in, one student team from each state will get a chance to fly their, their payload on a sounding rocket or a balloon. That's really cool. I mean, yes, we're lucky true. at NASA because we have really cool stuff that we do. <laughs> but but the, 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 the thing behind that is really having those students learn that, that art. Because, and and to, be, to experience, I think what I said earlier, the, the collaboration around something that is bringing this idea into, into something that could uh, be a, a, the next discovery is really an exciting uh, wealth of work. And um, our students just love immersing those into those things. And, um, and then we also have learning opportunities that we do through educators. And just some quick examples on that. Uh, we have the James Webb Space Telescope mission, which I hope all of you have seen, um, the in incredible images that are coming back from James Webb. We have a James Webb Space Telescope toolkit that we have worked um, in aligning with standards that educators can take into their classrooms or into informal settings. And of course, coming up, we have the Artemis One mission, and in the ramp up to Artemis One, we issued uh, an Artemis Learning Pathway, which is an eight-week immersive experience that uh, educators can again use with their students. And it brings them along for the ride in learning about what is, what is Artemis, what are some of the STEM concepts associated with that, and, and involves them in some uh, educational activities that they can learn more about the exciting business of STEM. Hmm. That is exciting. Um, Yes. So as you were talking about those pr practical experiences, and especially around the instrumentation, um, some of our, our arts integration uh, classes and experiences include things like creating instruments, but functional instruments from recycled materials. So that's something that we can start with even at a younger age that we hope will spark curiosity yes. and interest as we're looking at these more sophisticated experiences that you would have as well. But those types of um, professional learning experiences and classroom experiences for students start at a very, very young age with just items that are around the house that can, again, begin to spark that curiosity and look at those connection points between the work. So again, we're, we're all on the same pathway and trajectory, but again, in this case, we started with the art form and looked at the connections. Here you started with the science, but that's where the marriage, I believe, of the, st of the STEAM really comes together. Yeah, and if I could add one thing, sure. Susan. Um, and just look, hearing Jeanette, one of the things that we, we really um, hold as a priority is that NASA really cannot and should not do the work that we're doing in this space alone. And so we build strategic partnerships uh, with 
organizations. Uh, right now, I believe we have 35 active formal agreements for STEM engagement with organizations such as Microsoft, Discovery Education, Lego, Crayola. Um, and, and an example is with Lego, we did a collaboration with them this past year, just a few months ago, that is still online, I believe, and available, and it's called Build to Launch. And it was, again, focused on the Artemis One mission and uh, a 10-week learning series for students to engage with a guide or an educator. Uh, we also have a, a partnership with Crayola and there's a great intersection example with uh, the arts as well as the Lego, that notion of building something. And with Crayola, we had, uh, they took our content and developed a number of activities for students. And we also aimed to reach very young students and their families through uh, Tom Marshburn, uh, one of our astronauts on board the International Space Station, reading Goodnight Moon, uh, the book. Um, live from the ISS. And, and so there, there are those connections with organizations that can really expand our footprint in a way that might be quite different than, than the one that we, you might typically think for NASA. And then finally, we do work with performing arts organizations. We have had partnerships with the Kennedy Center. Jeanette and I were talking about that before we came on stage. And uh, in that space, what we're doing is reaching families and children who we might not normally reach. So those, I'm a musician, so those musicians out there who are, who are, are wanting to hear maybe space-inspired music, but what we do is then bring our content and our people to be able to have students see a STEM superstar up there that may perhaps look, look like them and can talk to them and they can relate to. Um, as well as bringing uh, materials and content and exhibits as well. So th those collaborations have yielded really fantastic results for us. I love the idea of reaching students who might not be as engaged in yeah. traditional learning methods. That's really great. And if I could just make one quick closing statement, we have a significant number of arts education resources for educators across the country and in fact across the world that are educator created and also tested and tried by a number of other colleagues. Um, partnerships is critical to our work. We do not do this alone. Um, in fact, one of our larger initiatives now is Sound Health with a collaboration between the National Institute of Health and the Kennedy Center looking at the intersection of music and education and health and wellness. So we really look to work with our colleagues across the country in a variety of settings to help us amplify and create authentic experiences that last for a lifetime. So we hope you'll join and look at some of our resources and share those with others. And we have to leave it there today. Chris and Jeanette, thank you so much for sharing your time. Thanks for being here. <laughs>
and throughout 160 years heritage, uh, we've remained committed to the education uh, uh, community, the advancement of education, and educators as leaders. And it's with that in mind, I want all of you to join me in welcoming your next speaker, uh, who's dedicated all of her career to supporting and helping educators, uh, our group retirement senior director, Bernadette Mitchell. What an incredible program this has been. I want to, Brad, thank you, all my equitable colleagues, Candace from the Atlantic, and truly all of you. Every one of you touches education in different ways. I had such a nice time talking to a few of you at the breakfast, and it's really amazing to me to hear these speakers. But we want to dig in a little bit on the role of educators as leaders. And, you know, your impact is far-reaching. I know you know that, but it starts in the classroom, but it lifts into the fabric of our nation, our communities. It's been an unprecedented year. You heard Candace say it, two and a half years, but your resilience and dedication has led the way and really highlighted the importance of public education and education, private education, all the different ways that we touch education um, for your communities, your colleagues, those students. You are the pillar behind the education system and the engine that keeps it thriving. Uh, I went to school down the street at Georgetown, and that's where sort of my focus on education began. Uh, and then my 20 plus career, not only in business, uh, but here where I worked a little bit on the Hill. Uh, but that's what's really allowed me the opportunity to play a role in supporting educators that it's been such a privilege and honor. But we're gonna give you some of that, how we're focused and some of the things that you're telling us back so that we can move forward. And that's Equitable's focus not only on financial education, but also helping achieve financial goals today and through retirement. Uh, so you hear it, we're focused on educators, but we have a million, we're so proud to say this, we have a million people that we can proudly call our clients. And that role of education and leaders, uh, where leaders is beyond a specific title or role. Right? Equitable is dedicated to that empowering educators through guidance by providing those resources and honestly to hear what's most meaningful to you so that we can meet you where you are. Health and wellness, right? care for each other, care for our students. That added economic stressors, we feel it. We know what's going on around us. Right? There's the market volatility, there's inflation. But forums like this that the Atlantic has put on, it allows us not only to share some of those resources on the key topics that are relevant, that matter, but we're intently listening. Know that we are intently listening and we want to hear your voice directly. Because we don't want, you heard it from, from uh, Secretary Cordona. He said, we don't want to go back to the way we were. We know that, that's critical. And that appreciation for what you do and it takes to be an educator in today's environment. I love so many resources in the Atlantic. It's just so rich, it's filled. Two that I wanna to point to. How can I give my all to both? How do we work on that uh, work-life balance? Uh, if you have one happy teacher, you have 100 happy kids. And for all of those of you who are also parents, we know that we're only as happy as our least happy child. So think of that and how that escalates. But our equitable advisors, those financial professionals, they're here to help and guide. I want to share some findings that you have told us that I want to bring back. Some are going to be very intuitive. You're going to say, I know that. That's obvious, but others I think you're gonna find is very surprising, but we're listening. Those surveys, focus groups across the, the classroom tables, at kitchen tables, forums like this, but how do we address the current environment? So you've pinpointed a few key areas that I wanna focus on. The most important are career longevity, uh, career paths, career satisfaction, work-life balance, we know that, and then what are some of those resources and support? So you've told us educators are still tr struggling with work-life balance. That's no surprise to anyone in this room. And, but we're concerned about the financial future. Where are we going? Educators report mid to high levels 
of both job stress and fulfillment. 72% are clocking 10 or few hours every single week outside of the classroom. So think about that. Two more hours every single day outside of those grueling hours, right? 36% rate their stress levels over the past year as somewhat stress. But listen to this. Almost half, 48% say they've been extremely or very stressed. And then only four respond, not at all stress. I'm not sure who those are. <laughs> but those 4%, we want that to be at the 50%. We need that to be at the 50%. What are some of the tailored, unique resources, right? That's where it's important. Because what's going to matter to me is going to be different than what's matter to you at different times. Where is that support, right? Educators are in great need of relief from staffing shortages. You heard it, right, on the panels. Uh, through intangibles, though, this is really, really big. Like increased respect from our communities, gratitude. That goes such a long way. And in terms of financial support, educators most want advice on saving for retirement and growing wealth. Let's dig in a little bit on that. So based on personal financial goals, the areas where educators need the most support include saving for retirement. That's at 43%. Growing wealth, 37%. Advice on investing, 28%. And managing debt. We need to manage that debt, 24%. Those are the tailored resources. Those are critically important, those tools, those solutions to meet you where you are. We know when educators have opportunities to demonstrate leadership, the entire school community is affected. They gain mutually. That's really beneficial, those ways. Teachers in environments where, that are emphasized on teacher leadership, really investing in teacher leadership, Input, people want input in decision making and collaborative, collaboration with their peers. That's where we're showing significantly more improvement over time than their professional colleagues. By their 10th year on the job, it's almost 40%. They were 39% more effective. And there's all different measures of that effectiveness. Culture, student scores, people staying in the job, promoting others around them. So when teachers, counselors, administrators, and other educational professionals feel that they have more of a voice and that stake in the school community, they tend to be more committed to it, which can help improve teacher retention and create that environment where it becomes easier to recruit new teachers to the school when needed. Those are just a few of the things that I wanted to share with you. It's such an honor not only to be here with you, all of those of you are on virtually, but that role of educators as leaders and why Equitable is committed to empower educators with resources and beyond. We have a profound appreciation for what you do and we are intently listening. Thank you so much. Now, for our discussion on the path forward, the cost of college, please welcome Samir Gadkari, President of the Institute for College Access and Success, Martha Cantor, CEO of College Promise, with Adam Harris, staff writer at The Atlantic. Samir and Martha, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, audience, I actually wanted to say up front, uh, if you have questions, we'll, at the end of the conversation, we'll have five minutes for an audience Q&A, so start thinking of your questions as we're, as we're talking. Um, but I wanted to start off um, with the topic that's at the front, forefront of a lot of Americans' mind, the student debt relief. Um, last Friday, uh, an appeals court temporarily blocked the Biden administration's plan that would forgive up to $20,000 of student debt for millions of borrowers, but if the courts allow the student loan forgiveness plan to proceed, what is the impact of this type of policy? And Martha, I can go to you first. Sure, I mean, first of all, millions of people will be allowed to move forward in their lives, especially black and brown folks. You've heard the secretary talk about that this morning. The second thing is there is 
opportunity for those individuals to enter the workforce, to get more education, to continue on doing the things that matter. And I think I said to you earlier, you know, maybe not to get a house, but to get and have the revenue to continue an apartment, to continue the living expenses, the basic needs that are just out of reach. So I think we'll also see people coming off the, the rolls for subsidized debt and food stamps and moving into a far better life. And, and I'd agree with that and just add that for so many millions of Americans, we were seeing them before the pandemic struggling with this debt, losing uh, not only their ability to have homes and to move on with their lives, but even losing some of the social safety net uh, programs and uh, having their wages garnished. So uh, this will really off offer an opportunity for a clean slate for millions and millions of borrowers. Absolutely, and, and actually related to that, if the policy is halted, um, is there, are there other policy solutions that uh, the administration could pursue um, instead of um, the debt relief policy that could also make a similar dent? I mean, one thing they're doing is implementing an Office of Basic Needs. Mm -hmm. So funding that office, funding those resources would help students over time. That's one thing. Increasing the Pell Grant would be another. It won't offset the debt reduction, but those are ways to increase the revenue streams for these students. And so, you know, I think that I think about this in terms of things to help some of the existing borrowers and then things to help the new people who are entering college. On the existing borrowers, you talked a little bit with the secretary about income driven repayment and some of the changes mm -hmm. to that program. So um, allowing um, allowing those payments to become more affordable uh, will help millions of people. Uh, it'll be important to continue some of the administration's actions to protect the earned income tax credit and social security and wages from garnishment for people who default on their loans. But on top of that, it's important for us to think about the front end affordability. Uh, as Martha alluded to, the Pell Grant is such an important piece of the puzzle there. In 1975, it covered 75% of the cost of a four-year public education, now it only covers about 28%. So restoring some of that purchasing power on the grant side so that people don't have to take out so much debt on the, on the um, front end would also help. And also, they've made it easier for public service loan forgiveness. So when the secretary talked about the shortage in teachers, that is something that I think could be a real benefit in stabilizing, at least in, in supporting the new workforce that has to come in into teaching. Absolutely. Um, and, and Samir, so Tikus was involved in piloting income-based repayment, um, kind of staying on the topic of, of ways to address the debt that people have, have already accrued. Um, but of course, Tikus uh, helped pilot the program years ago. And now those programs are being strengthened. How much of an impact do you think that'll have on sort of college affordability or the way that people think about college affordability going forward? Well, certainly, uh, I, I think that what we've seen in recent years is that there are far too many people struggling with their student loan payments. Uh, there was a study before the pandemic that the median black borrower owed more than they borrowed 12 years after entering to college. And so we see many people who um, tried college for a semester or a year, uh, in many cases didn't come away with a degree but have the debt. Um, and we need to help those borrowers. Certainly, we also need to be attentive to uh, making sure that we uh, create uh, stable tuition over time uh, and address affordability more holistically on the front end as well as a complement to some of the things that we're seeing in income-driven repayment. And we also need to protect students from fraud and abuse in the higher ed sector, protect them from the career education programs that create a lot of debt but very limited or no gain in earnings. Um, Martha. You know, you've, you've worked on College Promise for, for a long time. Um, I mean, of course, College Promise advocates um, advocates sort of for making the first two years or more of college free. Um, 
And the effort for universal free community college is kind of stalled at a federal level, but how have states and local municipalities um, made progress towards the goal of, of making those first two years or more free? Well, I'd say we have several hundred local programs. They're all on our website at collegepromisetool.org, so you can click on them, find out where they are, find out that they're across 48 states. And at the state level, what's been exciting, I guess, but also concerning in, in one way, is that states have moved to do more than traditional state aid. So I can just point to the recent news about New Mexico. Anyone in New Mexico can get a free opportunity to go to college. Anyone in Washington State, another example, can have that opportunity for the next 20 years. That's what the legislation has said, and that's really rethinking the tax base. Even in West Sacramento, voters actually voted to do a sustainable plan long term. So we're seeing a lot of innovation locally, statewide, but what we want is for the federal government to stabilize the opportunity for all, frankly, because black and brown students, first generation students, low income students don't have that opportunity. And you see in all these promise programs, once that opportunity is there, they will go to those programs. And even in Tennessee, there have been studies now, very, very reputable studies about debt reduction. If you get that, maybe we won't have 1.7 trillion in debt today. Well, I was actually gonna ask, what are, what are some of the kind of proven benefits of, of the College Promise program, right? People always wanna see, oh, well, what are, what are the actual results? So can you just talk about the benefits of, of having these programs? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the community, one benefit is that we have business, education, government, philanthropy, the students themselves coming together in a round table. You can see it in the Detroit Promise where the Detroit Chamber took that on. Washington State, the University of Washington, took that on with the community colleges. So one benefit is you've got local and state wherewithal from different sectors saying this is important to us. That's one thing. In terms of student outcomes, you know, the big challenge is getting students not to drop out, as Samir said, and get them to continue. And that's where education reform in the classroom that the secretary talked about is so critical. You know, giving students someone that matters to them, that's going to help them. And you see in Tennessee, you see in other states, a mentor is now being provided or other kinds of social supports, transportation, food banks in Dallas. So these are examples that are coming out of the Promise program that are gonna be benefit the students who come in. And Samir, did you have anything to add on that? I'll, I'll say that complement to the great work that Martha uh, and her organization have been doing across the country is the federal government creating a program that offers the resources to uh, create an affordability guarantee, working with states. Um, states are, through the economic cycle, um, sometimes in a position where they have to cut funding. And the federal government uh, can play an important role in stabilizing those programs, ensuring that the funding continues and that uh, we can live up to the affordability guarantees, not only in the promise programs that exist, but also in creating greater opportunity and closing the gap in uh, meeting the cost of attendance for students from economically disadvantaged families across the country. And actually sticking with affordability, of course, Tikas does um, great work to help show people that college can be more affordable than they may, may think. How do you calibrate sort of messaging, right, to balance both addressing that misperception uh, and, and your fight to also make college more accessible? You know, students, uh, I think, are very attentive to the, the challenges that they face in affording uh, college in terms of the gaps that they face in terms of meeting the total cost of attendance. And our work at TICUS is very much to uh, meet them in that conversation where they are to show how state and federal uh, aid streams can help to meet as much of that cost of attendance for them as possible. So it's, it's certainly, uh, you know, I think that they are very aware, in most cases, the students that we talk to, the student groups that we talk to, that they have a funding gap um, in attending uh, public higher education institutions, whether at the two-year level or at the four-year level. And so our role is, is to help them uh, and advocate with them for uh, changing that picture in the long term. 
I'd, I'd just add that I think when a mayor, or the mayor of San Antonio steps up and says, come one, come all to the two-year colleges, or when a governor says that, and there's messaging that is really local, regional, or statewide, that really helps the students say, I can have the opportunity. I think where we fall down is if you have to take a loan, and we hope you don't, here are the different options for you. I think a huge amount of work has to take place before the students go, because the students are just saying, or the families are saying, I can't afford it. I can't afford it, it's too much. But when you drill down and you see the different options, different pathways, then there's real opportunity for students. And we've talked a lot about um, some of the different models for increasing um, sort of college affordability, but what are some of the other most effective policies that you've seen work that make college more affordable? Martha, I'll go to you well, first. Well, I was going to say, when, uh, the, when, when the governor of Tennessee took money out of the lottery form, out of the state lottery, and put it in an endowment, like any four-year place that does endowments, or philanthropy has endowments. That is one strategy where the money grows, and they've added more money to that, and it is sustainable over time. You know, it's likely not to have different political um, walks of life go in and change that. Another one is, you know, as I said before, when voters say, we want this, or when there's a tax incentive where, you know, corporate in, in the state of Washington makes, um, makes a legislation that goes for 20 years. That's a long time. So there are different options for curbing the costs and keeping the opportunity open, but it's not widespread. You know, a lot of it, especially with the pandemic money, which I worry about in College Promise programs, we're using the pandemic money for one, two, three years, scholarships, we're giving students those scholarships, but I worry about that cliff, and that's where I go back to, can philanthropy join with business, join with government, join with the education partners, and do a whole lot more together? And uh, one of the things that we at TICUS have been doing, along with uh, our partners MDRC and the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunity at Notre Dame, is working with a suite of uh, programs that have shown that they can increase college completion. And uh, so in San Antonio, there's a program called Project Quest. Uh, there are programs like One Million Degrees, Bottom Line, and CUNY ASAP that have shown that they can increase college graduation rates, maybe even double them in some cases, through uh, some financial supports, through intensive uh, student supports and advising. And uh, so that's a, a proven solution that helps us address one of the big problems that we have, which is that many people start college but uh, don't have the support that they need to be able to complete. Uh, the Department uh, of Education has put forward a $5 million pro grant program to support some of these programs. And uh, ultimately, we would, uh, we are eager to see and advocating for um, more resources for programs like that to give students those intensive supports in colleges across the country so that they can get to the finish line and so that they're, they have that degree and the, the better job that might come with it to help them with any debt they might have to take on. So we're gonna take questions from the audience in just a moment, um, but I have one more question for you both before we do. So we've seen a, a total decline of about 7% uh, seven and a half percent in college enrollment since the pandemic began with community colleges being hit especially hard. What are some of the factors behind that decline in, in enrollment? Well, one is the need to work. So because college costs have spiraled so much, students need to work more, and we've seen that. On the K-12 side, we've seen declining enrollment. When we see the cost of college, tuition spiraling, all those things come together to say, I don't know where I'm gonna go, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Yeah, I think that the, the causes of that in some ways may not be uh, surprising for, for many people in the audience. Um, to an extent, uh, it's certainly related to the pandemic, uh, a tight labor market where people can, um, can get, get jobs, and uh, I think that that's, of course, um, been, been good for them. Um, but then also, you know, struggles with childcare, with the cost of college, with the um, challenges of student loan debt that they've seen their friends and neighbors um, take on. So, uh, you know, I think there's many, many causes. Um, but 
there are some early signs that maybe some of the enrollment declines have been stabilizing to an extent. Um, so hopefully that's the case. Um, so we're going to move to to audience questions while you're. Um, well, I guess we'll have some microphones that are coming around. Um, the microphone in the back that's coming around. Um, but we we'll, while you guys are getting your questions together, we have one from online. Uh, Jean asks, "Do you think that the debt forgiveness program will be more effective if it is combined with job training and financial planning for the targeted group?" Well, certainly, uh, I think this is one of the virtues of the college completion type efforts that. I was talking about many of those programs combine uh, advising, they combine connecting people to uh, mentors, uh, e even in some cases connecting them to, um, to the workforce and workforce training uh, with some of those financial supports. I mean, I, I don't think that adding burden, adding requirements, if you look at all the research around the country, and especially in Promise, you add more requirements, you add more GPA, you add more I have to live in this particular part, you get students dropping out or saying it, it's not for me. So I like the idea if there were paid internships for students who were in college that are relevant to the careers that they're interested in, I could see something like that. I could see something spiraling up with work study being much more inclusive and equitable. Um, but, and so I, I don't think putting an earning slice onto the debt forgiveness is really going to do it. Uh, other question? Yeah. All right, can you hear me? Do you think that the yield for colleges, which is about 50% of the face rate of the tuition, is, a, is actually an indicator that college tuitions are too high or fair allocation by the colleges to try and cut tuition to bring more students in. I mean, 50% of yield, I don't think most people realize that a college actually collects only about half of what their face rate is. What do you think about that? Uh, well, you know, I think that one of the things that's important to, to bear in mind as we think about the higher education landscape is that there are so many students who are attending college close to home in open access institutions. Um, the majority of students are within uh, 50 miles of home. And in those colleges, we tend to see that they are, aren't necessarily the ones that have a lot of pricing power. I certainly think that what you're, po what you're pointing to is um, the institutional grant aid as, a, as a, a price discounting mechanism for more and more students in wealthier colleges. And uh, you know, I think that there are questions about what effects that has for equity in, in enrollment and admissions. Uh, so I, I appreciate the question. Another question up front? Hi, Kathleen Delaski from the Education Design Lab. Um, a lot of community colleges in particular are starting to kind of rethink their role as maybe not being so much degree granting institutions because fewer and fewer, particularly adult learners, are heading, you know, are coming to them for that. They're looking for shorter term pathways. Uh, like micro pathways, but yet when when they were designing these kinds of pathways, what they're finding is that federal financial aid doesn't cover them um, because a lot of them are on the non-credit side of the house. Do you feel like there's any movement or traction federally, um, in particular, to, to to kind of help federal financial aid consider these kinds of uh, these kinds of uh, shorter-term pathways and that lead to you know uh, family-sustaining jobs um, that are in high demand? Well, certainly, I think that last part of your question is, is a really important uh, a caveat, right? That there are some credentials that lead to those family sustaining jobs, and there are, there are many that don't. And so I think that um, the big question confronting federal and state policymakers is how much can we uh, ensure that we're putting students on a good path to a stable job with good wages uh, and making sure that um, federal and, and state aid are, are directed towards that end. And I would just say, if you look at the variability of short-term training and the major studies that have been done on that, you'll see that there are lots of short-term programs that are high cost that go nowhere. And also, in community colleges, there were certain fields, and I think you're seeing some change to say, 
these fields are not going to accrue what I call a family sustaining wage or a living wage. So I think higher education in general needs to do a sweep of programs that are not yielding the outcomes for the career technical side, whether it's two or four year, that, that we would like to see for students. But the good short-term training programs, yes, I think you know if there is research to say they are resulting in the higher wage jobs, yeah. But I don't see I don't see Pell for short term training. I want to see Pell if there's short term training for Pell. I want to see that training linked to further education, because it's usually with all of the many many fields changing where students are going. You see students changing degrees, changing majors, and I think we need to think about that. Um, I have actually one final question for for you all. Um, what, what are some of the ways, uh, what is one way, um, this is for each of you, what is one way that higher education can prove its value and deliver on the, the value that it, is, that it is offering for students? I would say, you know, have the pathways that lead to outcomes and not just graduation. It would be graduation, co career, and the ability to be a civic participant in their community and society. And I think that's a piece that gets lost. But what we want are the soft skills that make people successful in addition to the training that they need for the jobs that they want. And I'll say that I think we need to become more attentive as a higher education community to the differing values for differing student populations by geography and by race. You know, I, I would be remiss not to give a plug for your excellent book, The State Must Provide, that looked at the long arc of <laughs> Uh, racial inequity uh, in higher education and the under-resourcing of certain institutions and students, particularly black students. And uh, when students are thinking about value that they're going to get from higher education, I think that they are attentive to those differences and what the labor market is going to look like for them in their geography based on the education they will get. And so I think we need to become attentive to and address as uh, as you pointed out the many resource uh, gaps in the higher education arena. And I'd like to see public higher education joining together because they are the least resourced, as you say, the least resourced in the country. And so how can they come together and show the innovations and supports that you know, um, Samir mentioned in, in terms of the outcomes, in terms of the career preparation, because it's too siloed. We'll have to leave it there for today, but thank you both so much for joining us. Welcome. And now for our conversation on responding to the youth mental health crisis, please welcome Kevin Dayhill Fuchel, Executive Director of Counseling in Schools, Mia A. Smith Bynum, Senior Director for Science, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the American Psychological Association, with Kate Julian, Staff Writer at The Atlantic. This is not a creation of the pandemic, right? But we know that between 2007 and 2017, the suicide rate for people 10 to 24 doubled, and more than doubled. In 2019, on the eve of the pandemic, 37% of high schoolers said that they were persistently sad or hopeless in their feelings. Given that, before we sort of get to talking about the causes and responses, Mia, I know you've given a lot of thought to the topic of why prevention and early intervention are so important. Can you kind of make the case to us as to why this should be an urgent priority for schools right now, given all that they have on their plate at this moment? 
Sure. So one of the um, kind of headlines I want um, folks to take from this is that when kids are struggling with mental health issues, they can't learn to their maximum potential. And childhood disorders, um, mental health issues typically start during the childhood years. There's a set of them that if we are better at um, capturing them and uh, treating them, we can reduce the chance of a lifetime of suffering. Um, kids who struggle with depression, particularly during the teen years before the brain is finished developing, are at greater risk of having multiple episodes of major depression as they um, enter young adulthood and beyond. And so being able to identify it early, provide appropriate treatment and care, I mean, and then also um, supporting that young person as they're trying to stay on track with their, their learning is going to be critical. And, and just to underscore, so that's if we were to intervene and treat those cases of depression earlier, their later trajectory would be different. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Kevin, your organization um, has been in this game for a really long time. How are things actually different post-pandemic, both for the needs of the kids that you're working with and in terms of you know, the, the, the opportunities, shall we say. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Counseling in schools has been working with communities around mental health, social emotional learning for 30 years. And we have about 100 or more uh, mental health practitioners, behavioral health practitioners, integrating into schools on a daily basis, um, really partnering with schools on a community level. And what I would say is that the, the, the pandemic sort of exposed things um, rather than created things. The systems that were in place that were conspiring to sort of put the pressure on students, mental well-being, um, really just kind of came to the fore. And you really see things uh, uh, coming together in a way that, you know, we talk about the disproportionality in communities of color around how the pandemic hit and how that speaks to, the, to the, our health systems and how that speaks also to our child welfare systems. And when we, went, when we went into the remote mode of beginning to try to stay connected to students during that terrible time of isolation, we were really seeing some of these kind of issues just, you know, just, just becoming bigger and easier to see, right? So one example was you know, a, a young woman who, a young girl in, in, in a middle school um, had been with her grandmother um, and her grandmother got sick, and so she got moved to a paternal grandfather. And the paternal, no one really understood or knew that the relationship that this young woman had to her paternal grandfather left her in a very unsafe situation. She was able to reach out to one of our counselors, and we were able to find, through a network of supports in New York City, how we could get that situation <coughs> made safe for her. But what, what I really want to say about that is that it really exposed these systems that are under tremendous pressure all the time and the ways in which people are trying to just you know, support each other, stay safe, do what they need to do. And the pandemic just kind of blew the lid off of some of that. Um, and it really kind of leaves us in a situation to say, like, well, why? Well, what is different, right? Well, what, what is the opportunity? And part of that comes from this pandemic then not just affected the students in the communities, it affected the teachers and all the adults in the building. So what I would say in, a, in a sort of a term that's come to mind is that it really lessened what I would call the trauma gap, right? Like we work in communities where there's tremendous trauma that the students are facing. And as the, you know, the secretary was talking this morning about things being normalized, and we have to sort of move beyond what's were acceptable as normalized. Well, the adverse childhood experiences or ACEs that children experience in some communities just as being like, hey, that's, that's what you get for living there, right? Suddenly, the adults who are coming from outside those communities to teach in those communities were experiencing some of the same things. So now, it's a bigger spotlight, it's a brighter light, and everyone's saying like, wow, we really have to do something about this. So that's something that's different, and I you know, definitely feel for the, for the teachers, and, the, and that, that was addressed by the secretary this morning as well in terms of the, the burnout and the needs of those teachers. But it really comes down to taking what was there before and, and putting it under a, mic, you know, under a kind of a magnifying glass for us to kind of like say like, hey, now we gotta do something. Yeah. Um, Mia, I'd like to follow up on the point just how different the scale of the mental health crisis can be from one group to another. And I think this story has been really undercovered by the media. But the spikes that I was just talking about when I was saying, you know, that, that more than, that the suicide rate had more than 
coupled, for example, these, these feelings of persistent hopelessness, many of them are sharply higher in black youth. Mm -hmm. That's particularly striking given that some of them haven't always been, right? Black youth haven't mm -hmm. always had a higher suicide. So can you try to just give us kind of a quick overview of what we know about what's going on there and, and what we don't know? Sure, so um, some of your audience members may be surprised to know that the uh, rate of suicide for black children between the ages of five and 12 is twice the rate of that for kids of the same age. And these are relatively recent data. These data came out in uh, 2015 and uh, they were covering the decade prior. And so historically in the black community, um, there's a saying black folks don't commit suicide. And so these data are particularly striking. Some of the things that have changed um, from a societal standpoint is that um, uh, our communities uh, used to be entirely segregated, um, even from uh, working class, low income families, all the way up the income spectrum. And so there was a bit more of a cocoon around black children and families. Um, uh, and that was one of the sort of uh, weird side effects of, of Jim Crow era. Now we're seeing a lot more income um, uh, income segregation as well as residential, which has persisted, those kinds of conditions create um, a lot more stress for kids. So as Kevin was talking about, um, the uh, ways that income inequality have, in, have affected the entire country over the past uh, 50 years, it's even more exacerbated for uh, black, black and brown kids. Um, then you add on top of that um, social media and some of the other stressors, because we sort of think of social media as sort this general non-specific kind of stressor. Social media is really based on your identity. You spend time in different spaces based on who you are, and that's a source of stress. You, that's where you see those viral videos of black folks being killed on camera by police and other kinds of stressors. And so kids are exposed to that because they're online. We do not have enough really precise research to explain the precise causes. Um, this topic has been really Funded over the last 30 years, it's changing a little bit, but um, we need way more research to really drill down on that problem because what that tells me is that black kids are really very highly stressed and we need um, immediate interventions to address it. Yeah, I, I, I would second and third that so emphatically. I remember trying to report a, a piece or a part of a piece on this topic before the pandemic and calling around trying to get answers as to why we were seeing these spikes among black youth. And I would talk to researcher after clinician after researcher after clinician and have people say, we don't know. There is no research. There is no data. Um, you know, it's certainly we know that, that youth of color have far less access to mental health services, which is part of why schools are such a, a crucial part of this, uh, of this puzzle. I'd like to come back to that, but I, I want to pick up on something you said about social media. I think that a lot of our conversations about social media and youth are so broad and so sweeping as to be kind of um, unproductive, right? We are not going to be able to put this genie back in the bottle. So we really need to understand who is being affected, because not everybody is being equally affected. And we need to also understand how. Can you hear me? OK how we are being affected, uh, or how, how people are being affected, what the actual mechanism is. And I, I know this is something that you've given um, a little bit of thought to, Kevin, um, just in terms of actual tactics that seem to be helping kids uh, in, in your organization's schools right now. Yeah. Can you? Yeah, no, I mean, I think the, the strategies to sort of come back and impact this, I was thinking about what you were saying, Mia, in terms of the um, you know, the impact on, on someone's own self-concept and, and their identity and what might lead that, identi that person's identity to feel like they need to leave this place, right? They, they're going to think about suicide. And one of, the, one of the strategies that we want to take is a public health strategy to sort of take some of the, the radioactivity out of the concept of suicide and, and have, and, and even with mental health in general, right? You say mental health and we start to think about some very narrow ideas about what that what that indicates, and you think about suicide, and it's in, you're in a school, and if you mention it, well, that gets candled by the person down down the down the hallway, around the corner, and don't tell anybody else, and we have to do all these things, and I think that part of that is what keeps people away 
from reaching out and seeking the help they need. So the social media platforms, as much as we don't understand quite how they're damaging, we know that there's also attempts to make them helpful, right? Talk space and some other ways in which you know, people use texting to stay in touch with their therapist, or they use different ways of reaching out. But I think we have to do a better job at keeping the situation normalized. And then sort of taking into account when we're thinking about how students are being sort of you know, socialized, the access to imagery that they have through this, the, the traumatizing imagery, right? There, there was a point, there was a time, I mean, I've been involved with counseling in schools since 1993, and there was a point at which when things happened, right, you didn't find out about it like in the minute that it was happening, right? Everybody here probably knows about the school shooting in St. Louis, like within, like it might not have even been, been fully finished by the police handling it. And that's something that was out on social media, something that was happening, the, you know, the, the bridge with the anti-Semitism you know, stuff going on. Everybody had those images. That means an eight-year-old had those images, a 12-year-old, an 18-year-old. How do they process these things? We have to be ready to understand that people are being consistently traumatized. How do you combat that? I think you have to consciously and effectively start to teach how to be resilient and teach hopefulness and positivities. One of, one of the techniques that we try to implement, particularly in one of our high schools, um, is talking to kids about, come, come back to the next day with three pieces of information, right? What was something beautiful you saw today? What is something that you benefited from that might have happened around you, right? Um, and the third B is gonna come to me at some point. Um, <laughs> there is a third B in there. Um, it, uh, it's beauty, it's benefit, um, and it's maybe something you could do better, right? So what are the things that you could put forward? And at first, people kind of look at this and like, oh, that's kind of Pollyanna-ish. Like, what do you mean something beautiful? What do you mean something benefit? Well, what we got to with students, because they wanted to talk, first of all, we talked to them about what they wanted to talk about. Students in high schools particularly want to talk about their mental health. They went out on strike to say, we're not coming back to school until we have more mental health supports. They know what's going on. If you ask, you get answers. If you just try to implement and do, then they're just gonna do what you know, they do. And they're gonna say, well, that, that wasn't my idea. Let it be their idea because their idea is right on target. So you, we, the things you hear, what was a benefit today? A benefit today was that you know, the conductor on the subway you know, got me to where I was going. That was a benefit today. What was something beautiful today? Oh, I saw someone wearing a jacket that I just thought was gorgeous, right? Um, and what's something that you're looking forward to tomorrow? What's something that, that you might think might happen the next day? Those are just training a mind to go opposite of the things that are being flooded into them that they don't ask for, but they're going to get. So let's give them the things that they need, right, that we know combats. We know from a psychological point of view, right, po what's the power of positivity, yeah. right? Yep. You, you, you're, you're preaching to the choir. I was like, yes, <laughs> all, all of that. And it, the, the, what you're talking about there, it, it's analogous to um, gratitude journals. Yes. Or if you're meditating, you're, and you're meditating on um, uh, things to be grateful for in life, and what the, that there's a brain chemistry uh, research base to that. That you're right. sort of teaching the brain to rewire it to focus on things that are that are better. And I and I know yes. that people would, would would say, oh, it's Polly, Pollyanna-ish, but it really does work. It really does work. Right, and you do it authentic and real. You don't say something that isn't real for you, right? You say what's real, and if you really start to focus on that. There are beautiful, I, I could look out and see that tree and say that's something like, most, you know, it's a beautiful tree. I could take that with me as a, as a mark of beauty for the day. I, I love this because it um, dovetails really um, quite neatly with sort of one of the very troubling recent findings about Gen Z. When we sort of try to think about what is affecting this group of people so, so, so profoundly, one of the most striking differences in their opinions and thoughts on the world is just the level of negativity. And there is a lot to be negative about, but if you look at sort of views on various issues, there's research coming out showing that Gen Z see, tends to view them not only more negatively than members of other generations, but more negatively than is actually sort of aligned with the facts. And so something like what you're talking about um, could, could have sort of a profound effect, I think. Um, Mia, can you just talk a little bit more about sort of the virtuous circle or cycle that, that dealing with mental health can sort of set in motion in terms of 
how it affects not only your sort of predisposition toward mental health issues down the line, as you were talking about before, but the rest of your life. I'd just like to hear a little bit more. Sure. So um, uh, we were talking a little bit um, this morning before this session. So uh, mental health wellness um, feeds everything else in your life. When you are in a good mood and when you're feeling good, you're able to do the things that we know from the evidence um, uh, maintains a good quality of life. Your relationships are good, you're eating right, you have the energy to go out and do that mile walk at the end of the day. That, that uh, So much of that uh, comes from a sense of a contentment and well-being in a general global sense. So that mind-body thing is really um, important. The other thing too is that um, Chronic stress, much of the stress that Kevin was talking about for kids, when that persists uh, from early in the life course through childhood and beyond, it is actually a risk factor for the development of different kinds of diseases. So mm -hmm. if you are born with a particular kind of disposition to physical uh, disease, whether that's a type of cancer or diabetes or whatever the case may be, um, that chronic persistent stress causes inflammation in the body that accelerates the disease and the aging process. And so when we intervene early, we're going to get a lot of good benefit from that. Um, let me talk a little bit more about, because I think you're talking about the brain chemistry piece. So, yeah, yeah. so if we're thinking about um, our adolescents who um, have come through and are going through uh, a, a very unusual time in terms of the stressor. So, put a quick example out there. Imagine a teenager who is an extrovert, was doing great in high school, on track to be valedictorian, and then suddenly um, uh, their plans for getting that color, sco color scholarship stopped because they can no longer participate in the target sport that they were involved in. They can't see their friends. And we know uh, extroverts here not being able to get out and socialize. That is a huge stressor. So fast forward to that young person. They're now, you know, six to nine months into the lockdown of pandemic, and they're starting to feel demotivated. They can't um, enjoy the things that they normally do. These are the hallmark symptoms of depression. That stressor and the persistent nature of it alters the chemistry in the brain such that the next time you experience a major stressor, not on the scale of a pandemic, but say you get a bad grade in an important class um, in college, that changes your brain chemistry such that every time you encounter a major life stressor, you're more likely to uh, develop an episode of major depression. And so we really don't think about it that way. Uh, we sort of think about it as depression is this sort of un, you know, um, uh, undefined thing. But the evidence shows us if we can get in there and get that kid the help that they need at the time, we can get that kid back on track and then build them up with those resilient skills mm -hmm. so that they're better positioned to respond to stress in the future. Okay, so we've got maybe two, one or two minutes before we move to questions. So okay. I'd like to do like a lightning round here. Okay. So following on what you just said, if you were queen of America and you could make sort of one systemic tweak to how we think about and provide mental health care, what would it be? Okay, well, do, do quick lightning round. First, more research on mental health in kids of color, LGBTQ kids, and ableism. Those, I put that out. Second one, I think we really need to be thinking about uh, mental health as primary care. So typically, when we think about uh, the pediatric visit, the well uh, child visit, the child will come in and they will often do a depression screen as a part of that standard annual visit. I think we should be thinking about that, like you should be seeing a Kevin, a psychologist, uh, four times, maybe two times during the year where you're going to get that thorough assessment. It's not part of that um, a wellness visit where they're checking your physical symptoms. That's one of the things I would change. I and love covered by insurance. Okay, same to you, Kevin. <laughs> so if you're going <laughs> to... Right. Well, I'll take Prince to your queen and try to... <laughs> take, take, take it another place, because I think schools, I think schools themselves are the places where we can do, do some of that on, 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 a, on a certain level as well. I see you know, counseling in school. We see schools as centers of healing and, and, and opportunities for hope. And the way that you can heal, help healing and provide hope is to very intentionally bring the social skill development and emotional well-being into schools as an integral part as much as academics and hold schools accountable for those things and hold students accountable for how they progress through those things. The, the um, secretary was talking this morning about the moment that we're in and let's not build the schools back to the way that they were. 
I say this is an educational reform moment to say that social skill development, emotional well-being, and academic progress are on par, and schools should be organized in a way that those things are addressed and taken care of. I love that. Questions. If you have a question, please go ahead and raise your hand, and we can bring a mic around to you. Yes. Do we have? I think maybe maybe you don't. I think you're probably good. Everyone, huge Atlantic fan. So my question: I'm a behavioral data scientist. So my question is: I just recently went into the school system. Never. I've already. I've always worked in civil rights on the housing side. So behavioral issues and the vulnerable population and housing specifically. Went into a school, tech and STEM school, and was asked to do the data there. So I realized that there's almost no data, like you said, on any. Uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. So my office is always, I can barely crunch my numbers. Thank you. Hi. I can barely crunch my numbers during the day because my office is always full of students who really should be in the counselor's office, but they fill up my office. And so they walk in and they say, Ms. Ammerman, I want to go on your numbers. And I'm like, so you want to be counted in the numbers of what used to be such a stigma. I'm 43. So in my generation, it was a stigma. The things we saw and heard and experienced, we didn't speak of. These kids really want to be included in the numbers. They want to be involved. So my question is, is there going to be, and I know there will be with all of you all here, is there going to be a push or some kind of initiative where I can dump these numbers because right now it's just sitting with me and I don't have anywhere to dump it or anyone to share it with? I'd be happy to give you my card. <laughs> Thank you. Honestly, I would love to see the, the information. I mean, in New York City, they're doing something called the DESA assessment, um, which is being administered by, um, by teachers and, and some of the other staff. And I, and I have some concerns about that. So I'd be really interested in a much more research focus you know, implementation of that. And that dovetails with what I was saying before, that, that students, students want this. Like, they, they know they need this. Part of it, the difference, I think, in a generation is that they see the impact of friends. They, see, they know the impact on themselves, but they'll probably first talk about, like, well, I have a friend who. That's also true, and it is also true about them. They're worried and they're scared about, about where they're headed, and, and they're not wrong, and they're reaching out for help. We, we should give it to them. I, that is a really excellent question. I don't have a quick answer for you, because I probably need to know a little bit more information, but I would take those data put them in some persuasive graphs and send them to uh, your, your congressional representatives. And one of the reasons why is that there are um, members of Congress who are advocates for mental health. And figuring out who those folks are globally, like in, in, throughout, throughout the whole Congress where you're talking about the Senate or the House, but then also your local representatives. And you can set up an appointment with them and say, this is what I'm seeing on the ground in your district. What are you doing about it? Mm. And, and put the because that is where I think the change because school boards are local and so part of what you'll run into there is like how do you make it universal and I think you've got to go to the um, institutions uh, who are charged with, with, with being responsible for that I think that's unfortunately all we have time for today um, thank you so much Mia and Kevin thank you <laughs>
Uh, in 2002, Murmuration and the Walton Family Foundation partnered on um, going deeper on Gen Z. What, uh, what are they experiencing? Um, what do they need more of? Um, and how can we sort of better understand them? Um, our, our primary goal there was lots of people were talking about Gen Z, but no one was really talking to Gen Z. Um, so we partnered with John Della Volpe at Social Sphere and really underwent sort of qualitative and quantitative research um, to get to know what are, the, what are the fears of Gen Z, what are the motivators, um, and what more do they need to see from those of us who are not in Gen Z um, to, uh, to really sort of realize their potential. Um, this August, we checked back in uh, because a new school year was starting, and we wanted to, particularly with high school members of Gen Z, so Gen Z is sort of age 15 to 25, um, so particularly with members of, 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 sort of the high school uh, cohort of, of Gen Z, um, how are they feeling about this new academic school year? And how are they feeling about going into an election year where lots of the issues that they care about uh, are going to be decided? Uh, in some cases, they aren't going to be able to vote, so won't have um, sort of the, the ability to weigh in on some of that. Um, you know, the findings sort of confirm I think, a lot of what uh, is talked about in Gen Z. Um, major themes, one you were just hearing about, really is that Gen Z is in crisis from a mental health standpoint. Uh, the majority of people we spoke to across the country had some, at some point in the last 30 days um, struggled with some sort of mental health issue. 28% had had a thought along the lines of, I might be better off dead. Uh, and over 60% were suffering from fear from, of gun violence, of sexual assault, and of losing friends to suicide. Uh, so that was just sort of a, whatever opening question we brought to those focus groups, that was one of the places that, uh, that these young people really wanted to go. Another common theme was they want a better life for themselves. They want to live happy, fulfilling lives as we would expect. Um, as we would hope for them, and they don't feel like their public K-12 education is giving them the skills that they need to do that. They feel that they're not actually learning the sorts of things they need to learn to go and get productive jobs, to lead a productive life, and to sort of feel fulfilled and, uh, and be able to stand on their own. Um, so that's certainly something that we've been digging in on. Um, Political engagement is something that's been talked a lot about with just this generation. You know, by 2026, this generation and millennials will make up over 40% of the electorate. And so obviously, that is something we should be thinking a lot about. Um, but Gen Z wants to participate. Uh, the problem is they don't actually feel heard or seen by those who are currently in office. Um, they feel sort of across the board something like 44% of, uh, of people said that they're um, school board representative doesn't understand anything about what they want or need, and that number, somewhere between sort of 41 and 45 percent, held true for congressional Democrats and Republicans, uh, and for local electeds, sort of writ large. Um, so, so they don't feel like those people who are in power are actually understanding what they need and, and are going to meet them where they are. And the follow-on theme, um, Walton engaged this this summer with. Uh, Edelman to also do sort of a deeper dive into the idea of sort of collaboration and cooperation across generations. And Gen Z has not seen that work yet. They don't have a model to point to of successful collaboration and cooperation. Um, and they don't believe that older generations are going to prioritize the needs of younger generations as they're making decisions. So there's sort of a lack of trust there as to what that could look like. Um, but with that, the, the real point of today is to talk to someone who is actually a member of Gen Z. Oh, Lamar, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I'll let you uh, sort of shout out and tell people a little bit of, about who you are. But really, where I wanted to start, um, you and I were talking about this sort of outside, is this question of um, your K-12 education system, whether or not it has prepared you, um, your colleagues, your friends, to achieve everything that you want to achieve in life, and what more these systems could be providing uh, to help you feel like you're on a path to be successful? Um, absolutely, so my name is Lamar Danley. I'm a senior political science major at Howard University. And so in my K-12 experience, I realized that K-12 is very standardized now. It's very in one direction. So I know how to search for things in a paragraph and I know how to put that on an answer sheet. But when it comes to critical thought, providing innovative thought to a space, but also providing the leadership and the collaboration in the team, that does not happen in K-12 through at this moment. And so when we get to college and we look for careers and uh, interviewers asking, so how can you provide innovative thought to the solution? 
solution? We don't know because we're looking for the answer in a paragraph. We're looking for a way to put A, B, C, and D, but we don't know actually how to provide the own solutions. So I think for me, K through 12 misses the fact of intertwining real life problems with education. There's no reason why math problems don't have math word examples or liter literacy and um, more civil engagement is not until our reading assignments in K through 12 education. So I think spaces need to start intertwining with personal problems and the world can be solved through the kind of assessments we take through school and not so standardized. So that was a great segue into another question we were just talking about outside, which is really what more would the system need to do to get you and your peers to be more engaged civically, to volunteer, to run for office, to vote? Um, what are the things that you need from K-12 to help set that up? I think we just need a space to have our voices validated, have a lot of leadership capabilities, and also be able just to provide a different aspect or a different perspective on education that people will listen to. I think that once we understand that we are the next generation that's going to carry the torch and someone gives us an opportunity to take that torch instead of being um, hesitant to give us that torch and thinking that we're not capable, having that space in K through 12 spaces will really allow us to be better adults in collegiate spaces and outside college. Do you have thoughts on what that collaboration with older generations can look like? How to uh, how we can all sort of be working together to solve some of the problems that are um, priorities for your generation and also, I hope, um, for mine and others? Um, absolutely. So I think the best thing to do is mentorship, but a mentorship that's not so one-sided, not so much telling the student, this is what you need to do, but asking the student, what do you want to do to be a better adult? And how can I provide those skill sets to you? I think it's more so of a trust and relatability. Me seeing myself in an older person, an older person seeing themselves into me. I think it's, it's a lack of respect on both ends. It's a lack of respect for younger opinions, but it's also a lack of respect for older people's perspectives. So I think we have to collaborate in that sense and be, again, validate people's opinions. It's no reason why, yes, I understand that you had a different fight, but I'm dealing with a different fight as well. And how can we meet in the middle to really provide the solution for society? Mm -hmm. Building on that a little bit, have you um, seen anything that, that works or that you, you think needs to be changed in terms of how um, sort of governments or institutions like your university, uh, employers, companies, as you're now thinking about sort of your next steps since you're a senior, uh, how they're interacting with Gen Z and how they could be thinking about it differently to sort of help you reach your, your fullest potential? Um, absolutely. So I think what works for me is just learning my story learning how I got here and how I got to this position, and listen to different Generation Z's stories. I think Generation Z is being generalized as one monolithic, but that's not true. And so I think once we look in someone's individuality and provide them with a resource specialized to them as a person, we'll be able to move forward in both collegiate spaces, business spaces, as well as government spaces. And I need governments to start thinking about smaller school systems, public school systems, as well as black and brown people in all aspects and minorities. Well, thank you so much, Lamar. Um, they told us eight minutes was going to go by in a flash. It really did. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I so appreciate your taking the time to share your perspective on all of this. And again, thank you all for being here and for listening. And um, I look forward to seeing you all as the next sessions unfold. Thanks. Now for our conversation on supporting our educators addressing teacher burnout, please welcome Olga Acosta-Price, Director of the Center for Health and Healthcare in Schools at the Milken Institute School of Public Health, Jennifer Martin, President of the Montgomery County Education Association, with Susan Salmi, Contributor at Atlantic Live. Jennifer and Olga, thank you so much for being here. We're talking about what is one of the most urgent issues of our time, something that people in the know are calling a five alarm crisis. Um, it's teacher burnout and beyond. This is a pivotal moment for the profession. So let's begin with this sobering statistic. Earlier this year, a National Education Association survey found that a staggering 55% of educators say they are thinking about leaving the profession earlier than planned. 
Now, that's a majority saying not just that they want to move to a new school, but that they are leaving the profession altogether. And Jennifer, you're in the classrooms. Um, can you help us understand this finding? Well, sure. I, I'm curious whether you or others in the audience saw the uh, scramble on the ice for dollars by teachers. It went viral. I see a few head nods. That pretty much, in a, a, for those of you who didn't see it, before uh, a hockey game with uh, the NHL, uh, teachers were invited on the ice to scramble on their knees for dollars and shove them into their shirts uh, in order to have money for their classrooms. Yeah. You know, I think that Secretary Cardona talked about the lack of respect we have for teachers. That was a stunning example of what is wrong with public education today. Uh, and the fact that there were teachers who were desperate enough and debased enough to take part in that tells us also how much we have been beaten down. So I don't talk about it in terms of teacher burnout. I talk about it in terms of exploitation. Too much is put on us, too much is asked of us, and not enough is provided as support for us in the crucial work that we do for society. To complement that, I have a, a colleague and, and friend, Doris Santoro, who uh, we worked on a research brief together to say, what do we know about the research and what it tells us, not just about the dire statistics, but what, should, what are the strategies that we want to make sure school districts and schools know about. But she talks about the concept of demoralization mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, teacher burnout. Because teacher burnout implies that your, your individual resources are spent and that it becomes then more of an individual issue that you somehow haven't been able to keep your resources up enough to manage the demands of the job. And she counters that and has researched and has talked to hundreds of teachers who've said it really is about a moral issue. It is about what's driven me to be an educator, what has had me come to this profession wholeheartedly is being taken from me. I, you know, the values, the, the, the creativity, the autonomy, the ability to engage with students at a more meaningful level has been eroded. And that leads to a sense of demoralization. And that is not an individual teacher solution that we have to uh, create. Right. That would require some structural exactly. support. So can you tell us more about what the research says those structural supports are, how easy or hard it would be to get those in more schools? Absolutely. So we have. Um, Again, as with the last panel, we do have more research we could do to really better understand um, the impact of some of these kinds of interventions. But I think many of them really are very uh, logical and um, are about, first of all, giving teachers voice in decisions and in the implementation of policies that often are very much uh, well intended. Uh, certainly to keep safety, to security, to allow for a rollout of curricula. But they often are implemented without specific teacher input. And teachers are best able to tell you what's going to work and not work in their classrooms and across the school. They also feel very put upon in terms of some of these mandates that really often are, again, well intended, but uh, implemented poorly. And they feel very devalued as professionals. You know, they're, they're professionals in the building who really should be consulted about a variety of things that they really have quite a bit of expertise about and, and often aren't. And so I think, again, the kinds of things that educators can do around what are the structures that you have for both regularly getting input from your teachers, your educators, your staff, what are the ways that you can be transparent about the kinds of decisions that have to be made? We, completely empathize with the role of educator uh, leaders, with principals, with superintendents. I mean, that's a whole nother panel to talk about in terms of uh, leader mm -hmm. stress. Um, but I think that often that lack of transparency adds to the insult, to not understand. Um, and so there are ways, we have examples, great examples of superintendents who, who bring together as part of their leadership team many key leader, teacher leaders who invite that kind of regular input, who look at how their day-to-day -day operations are and, and implement within each of those a way to do 
to check in with each other, to ask for input on how things are going, and actually take action based on those decisions. Mm -hmm. But we can't take every uh, recommendation, right? So we, we have to understand that at some point we're gonna have to have an executive decision, try things out. But in what ways can we do this in a continuous quality improvement kind of way? Right, teacher leader is such a good phrase. Right. Let's talk a little bit about how the pandemic changed things. It increased the workload. A too heavy workload means more stress. Teachers, as we heard in the last panel, students as well, interested in more mental health resources for everyone, themselves and students. Do you feel that the pandemic-related federal funding has helped in this regard? And if so, is it sustainable? Well, I think that with the federal funding, I think we've heard it's a stopgap that to try to make up some of the um, you know, most immediate problems that we're facing and to deal with the immediate issues. But what the pandemic did was expose longstanding issues that were never really truly addressed, where I think that there are many of us who felt a sense of urgency, but having the will uh, from uh, our elected leaders and from the taxpayers of our different school systems to actually pay for what's needed that has not been there. So the pandemic, uh, I, I love the expression that Kevin had, uh, that there's a trauma gap that closed. I think we all recognize what we depend on our schools for and what happens when the, that support for our families isn't there. Teachers are, are family uh, members too. They, uh, you know, we are mostly women. Uh, that actually is a problem in and of itself that our uh, workforce is over 80% female across the country. It's over 84% in Montgomery County. Um, mm -hmm. And we think that it would be important that we're attracting both, well, all genders to the work um, that um, in moving us forward from COVID, we need to be really reinvesting in a new way that gets back to those fundamentals that Secretary Cardona was talking about. It's that nine to three time when things are, um, you know, when the bulk of a child's uh, learning opportunities occur. Can I add sure. also that one of the things we hear consistently, certainly the, the federal dollars are going, have been helpful, but as you said, they're, they're quite temporary and we, wanna, we also want to make sure that there's teacher input in how those get spent and in what direction and what resources actually get brought in. But also I think that um, there's something that teachers want that is you can't buy, which is time. They want, protect, they want their time protected and valued for planning, for things like we want to recognize you're a human being and every once in a while you need to eat lunch and go to the bathroom and actually take a breath. But there's no time in the pressured environments that have only gotten more pressure during the pandemic. Um, and so these are more structural issues. How do we structure the day so that we allow for that planning time and protect the time for teachers? Even though we know we have shortages and people who are out where we have to cover for each other, but then w what are the possible structure solutions for that? How are we looking at our substitute pools? How are we encouraging sort of you know, greater involvement in those kinds of solutions? Because again, those are ones where Funding and money can support some of that, but it's not the full solution, it's not the full picture. Well, I'm gonna say time does cost money. Oh, that is true. <laughs> because what ends up happening is we end up doing multiple jobs in order to cover for folks who have not been hired. They're not out there, there's not a great pipeline of new teachers coming in. We're not attracting a new generation as we should because uh, I looked at Montgomery County, I asked for a researcher to give me in real dollars, inflation adjusted dollars, how much are teachers making now versus 20 years ago? We're looking at a 15 to 17% de decrease depending on whether you're you know, a first year teacher in 2002 and a, two, and a first year teacher today. That first year teacher today is making 15% less and it's worse when you move up in experience and education. And that's in Montgomery County, a, a school system that prides itself on being among the best paying in the metro region, which is a region that pays much better than most of the rest of the country. So we have a real problem in failing to pay an attractive wage and thereby also be able to have working conditions that are attractive. So the, it is um, 
you know, folks don't like me to say this because they're worried that I'm making this, the public school sound worse. We are in a moment where we can fix this, but right now we have a spiral downward because the pressures are higher, the wages are lower, and the respect is also lowered given the current political climate. So, you know, we are facing some really severe problems that lead to uh, a rejection of this as a career that's attractive any longer. We have an opportunity now to change that. You mentioned gender a little earlier. The NEA survey that I mentioned, they also found that a disproportionate percentage of black and Hispanic Latino educators already underrepresented in the classrooms are also looking to leave teaching. So how do we ensure that efforts to help teachers' well-being are equitable and inclusive and that there's a social justice component to this that recognizes race-based stress? Well, I am really happy to have that question because it's something that our union, the MCEA, has really uh, done a lot of work to try to support. We are interested in making sure that we're hiring for equity. We uh, are uh, very intentional in our leadership in the union to look for diverse uh, members of our group by every possible uh, you know, uh, dimension mm -hmm. uh, to, to make sure that we're hearing from different voices because you know, I'm very typical of the teaching workforce in America. Elder, older, white and female, I get that. Um, I will be very happy when we see much more the full range of who America is in our classrooms. It's good for every student, students of color and students who are white also because we all benefit from having that exposure uh, to different people in positions of leadership in our lives. I was lucky to have that in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Growing up, it was a very diverse teaching workforce I saw, and it made a difference in my ability to connect with people as an adult in my working life. So um, we are very much in favor of Grow Your Own programs. Montgomery County, we are a majority minority student body now, and we are saying we need to show our children that this is a great career, and here are the pathways to get there. And our community college system is also making those opportunities available. I want to see us build on that. The union supports that. In our negotiations, we bargain for the common good. We're looking not just out for teachers, but we are looking to do social justice work to make sure that parents have a greater voice in school decision making, that we put more money into investing in community schools models that are not just about wraparound services, but that are about inclusion of the community, inclusion of teacher voice in school level decision making. So we have a lot of energy and passion for making sure that public education remains strong locally and nationally here uh, because we feel that we are foundational to our democracy, which obviously has been facing tremendous risks and pressures. We're on the front lines of ensuring that we have a future generation of educated citizenry who will continue the democratic society that we are so fortunate to have here. Well, does your research speak to this? Uh, I was going to say that you know that that what we're sharing and what's been shared, I think, are evidence-based practices. You know what we know about the impact of uh, community school models, um, about the outcomes when you do um, invite families and caregivers and teachers to have a voice in decision making. The outcomes are better. The school climate is improved. Uh, there is um, there is better retention. So we we know the these things and yet there are there are resistances we do you know there are ways that then uh, other things take priority and collaboration is hard but it is so necessary if we're going to kind of move through some of this um, and I would say to the race-based stress and the question you had about that one you know other kinds of strategies that that leaders can employ is to really support their teachers of color or teachers who have minority minoritized identities so whether sexual minority teachers or others mm -hmm. to allow them spaces and to really participate in spaces that allow them not only to get mentored or feedback um, on their on their teaching or on their practices but really just to have a safe space to have, to be able to, to talk, to share, or they don't have to explain the microaggressions they constantly feel they're dealing with. But that, that kind of support 
is quite necessary, but particularly for those who are underrepresented in, in their communities. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 again, it speaks to this kind of whole school approach that, that I think many of us are talking about, whether we're talking about students or, or educators and teachers. Thank you. Uh, the Montgomery County um, Education Association is currently in the process of negotiating a new contract with the school board. Um, what are your priorities in these negotiations? Well, first of all, we would love to get to the table. We're already having difficulty uh, agreeing to ground rules. We want to have open negotiations that our members can observe because we feel that it's important to have folks be aware of what the process is, uh, what the proposals are that are being made, and how those are being countered. Um, right now, the school system has been resisting since June to have open negotiations. So we are um, trying to figure out ways that we can um, uh, get their agreement to um, provide more visibility to what's going on. Um, and to show that you know, we are both coming with nothing to hide, where the union is ready to put our proposals forward in public uh, view, and we're not sure what the school system is afraid of. Um, that said, if we ever get to the place where we can actually negotiate the contract, <laughs> um, we are looking to totally redesign the salary scale. There has been a change in Maryland. The, you may have heard of the blueprint for Maryland's future. It is a new way of uh, both structuring schools and funding them from the state. And so there are real um, uh, incentives for teachers to pursue national board certification. Uh, that is going to be the pathway to a career ladder. Secretary Cardona was talking about finding ways for there to be teacher leadership and career advancement. The state is trying to do that. We are trying to rebuild our salary scale to make sure that the bottom is lifted up because right now it, it is almost impossible for someone to go into to teaching if you haven't got help from someone else to help you pay for a place to live, let alone all the other necessities of life. So we're looking to lift the bottom. This blueprint calls for $60,000 as a starting salary for teachers. That in Montgomery County does not get you far. That may do well someplace like a Garrett County or you know, someplace where the cost of living and particularly housing is less. But for our teachers, that really is a floor that's too low. Mm -hmm. So we'll be looking to try to build up to a better starting salary and then to have fewer steps to get to the top so that people can have lifelong earnings that uh, provide for their future as well as for their working lives. Uh, you know, beyond that, as I said, we're bargaining for the common good. We're looking at things like housing security, not only for our folks, but for our families in, in the schools that we serve. We're looking to have uh, social justice ad addressed through there's a, a just schools movement through NEA and we are looking to have restorative justice be a bigger a part of school life to provide time for things like the res restorative circles mm -hmm. to, and to have the opportunities for kids to really feel a sense of community in the classroom. Well when a teacher is harried those relationships don't get developed. As a high school teacher, I see 150 students a day. That it is very hard to know the backstory on every child every day and to know what they're bringing into the classroom. And it's hard for them to know me too when they're in a scramble from bell to bell. Right. So those are some of the things that we're looking to advance in our contract and kind of the spirit that we come to this with. We believe that we have a responsibility in our contract, not just to bargain for ourselves, but to bargain for the benefit of the communities we serve. I think it's a great time to bring the audience in. I'm going to start with a virtual question, and if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, someone sends in the question that says, maybe to the point that you just made, maybe we need to change the timing of the school day and how many months students are in school to be able to fit more things in. What do you all think of that? I, I don't know the research very well on this, so I feel a little bit hesitant to, to to answer from that perspective, but I'll jump in first. Anecdote. Sure, yeah. I mean I have some ideas here. We ha we have a couple of schools that are innovative school year uh, calendar schools. They run uh, throughout the year with some gaps uh, of breaks in between those sessions. Uh, what I hear from our educators is that it is exhausting. Uh, they're only paid a stipended rate 
during that extended part of the school year. Their salary stops. So the work they're doing for, through, for the 12 months of the year, not all of it accrues to their pension. That's a problem for us. But if it was you know, properly paid. If it were properly paid, we think, you know, and I think also the workload issue is the problem here mm -hmm. because the 10 month people are overworked and exhausted. And, and, you know, we're training in the summer and doing things on our own time unpaid. It's a furloughed time of the year. So we are, you know, that needs to be addressed. If you're going to lengthen the school year, you've got to take things off the plate so that the workload is sustainable. So that's, I think, where we're really, um, you know, we are very open to those ideas, but there has to be, it can't be that the teacher is doing more, but effectively getting less. Right, right. Question right here. Oh, I don't think so. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Um, Hi. Yeah, hold it really Jody quick. Scissors, I'm a former Montgomery County uh, public school teacher, and I uh, thank you for your service and your work and all of the MCA reps that were in buildings that I worked in, so thank you for that. Um, now I'm an arts integration administrator and host of the Great Teacher Resignation podcast. Mm -hmm. We've talked about STEAM, data, mental health, and one of my colleagues who is a principal in Montgomery County public schools uh, says that teacher success is student success and student success is teacher success. How do we redirect attention to teacher wellness and teacher mental health to create an, an environment where teachers want to stay, we want to retain them, and we want to continue to model for students what it looks like to take care of yourself so you can open up that cognitive capacity to work at your fullest? Oh, well, it looks as if that's directed at me, so I'll start. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good question. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, and it's nice to see someone who uh, is a former colleague. Um, so uh, we, we talk a lot about how students' learning conditions are, are teachers' working conditions. So the, the stress that teachers are under, of course, carries over to the student as well. They're not receiving the attention the um, tailored education that they might need. You know, we, when I started teaching, it was all about differentiation. Now it's about standardization because students are data providers and teachers are data collectors in the service of standardized testing so that the system has, uh, you know, numbers that they can then use for analysis. We've moved away from child-centered education in a way that I think is very uh, bad for students and it also makes the work joyless. Um, so um, do I think there's a place for data? Yes, we need to be data informed. But when we are testing so much, I heard an elementary school teacher told me 28 days she had some kind of required testing in the first weeks of school that she had to provide to her elementary students in first grade. You, and if you are a special education student or an English language learner, you're going to be in longer amounts of testing because you have the English language learning students have more tests they have to take, and both groups have more time in which they need to test. So that's less learning time. So I don't know if I've addressed your question, but there, you know, really what we're talking about is making sure that we have full staffing, that we have uh, the time structured in a way that teachers can actually provide the care that our students deserve and um, provide, you know, create that environment where students feel known and know the people who are caring for them. Oh God, give you the last word on this. Okay, um, <laughs> we feel very strongly, for example, that most schools know about a multi-tiered system of supports. It's how we organize our, our interventions and supports for students. We rarely think about how we can apply the same organizing framework for teachers. And yet, as, as we said, and, and part of what I would say is if we did in, uh, put more intervention, more support into teachers, we would see the benefit um, at, at the student level. Um, if we were to take that approach and we said, what is universally needed by every teacher in this building, every staff member, every adult, right? And we thought about that, but you need to know your community. Right, because it may be a little different in one school versus another in terms of what the teaching force needs. Right, but what can we make available? And it's the same principles that we should use for students. We want people to feel safe. We want people to feel seen. We want people to feel understood. 
right? That's the same whether you're a student or an adult. What are the processes that we have to identify when someone needs more support? How can you safely identify someone to more targeted support? We do that for young people. We should do that for the adults in the building. What is the confidential ways that we can make sure that those, uh, that communication's there? And then how do we deal with you know, more intensive or urgent situations where someone is more in a crisis, we're trying to prevent a crisis. Why we have those processes for students, where are they for our adults? And it just helps to kind of organize and think about how comprehensive that approach needs to be. Teacher wellness is not an, it should not be solely a self-care, we're not gonna self-care our way out of this crisis. This has got to be a comprehensive wellness strategy that has to think about our entire school community. And I would argue we need to start with the adults because it will benefit um, everyone, the whole school community. Great points. Thank you thank both. You. We have to leave it there. But thank you so thank much you. for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope today's program was a valuable experience for you all. As a mother of three children and one in college, I found today's conversation, and I was directly impacted, but incredibly resourceful. We all came here today with a different why for being here, and quite honestly, if we're not having a discussion, we're not gonna get closer to the solution. Please take a moment to share your thoughts with us by completing our post-event survey. Your, impu your input is very important in helping us shape the future of programming here at Atlantic Live. If you are watching virtually, you can find the link to complete the survey in the chat. You'll also receive a link directly to your inbox following the conclusion of our event. If you would like to stick around to virtually network with other attendees, you can do so by clicking the networking button on the left side of your screen. For those of you here in DC, please stay and join us for a lunch in the room and terrace next door. Thank you again to all of our speakers and to our underwriters, Equitable and Walton Family Foundation for their support of the Atlantic's journalism today. Thanks again for joining us and have a safe trip home.